All right. I will now call this session of the Washington History Seminar to order. Welcome, everyone, uh, to the seminar, uh, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a new book by Donald A. Ritchie entitled The Columnist, Leaks, Lies, and Libel in Drew Pearson's Washington, published by Oxford University Press about a week ago. Joining us for the discussion today are Kathy Kiley and David Greenberg. I'm Eric Arneson from George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my longtime colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture uh, of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, we have been meeting weekly in pre-COVID times at the Wilson Center uh, in person uh, and since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. And we have a continuing lineup of sessions still ahead of us this season that will take us to late July, including one this coming Monday, June 14th at 4 p.m. when we discuss Dorothy Sue Cobble's new book, For the Many, American Feminism and the Global Fight for Democratic Equality. Please join us for that session as well as today's. Behind the scenes, there are a number of people who make these seminars possible. Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. Uh, we like to thank our various contributors, uh, our financial supporters, both anonymous and not so anonymous. And as always, we invite you to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer session of this webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function uh, on Zoom or the Q&A function. Those watching on Facebook Live can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, Zoom screen, all yours. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. Um, appreciate uh, the introduction and also a warm welcome uh, from me and from the Wilson Center to all of you and especially to our panelists. Uh, I have the uh, privilege of introducing the panelists and we'll start with our featured author, Donald Ritchie. Donald A. Ritchie is historian emeritus of the U.S. Senate. At the Senate, he conducted an oral history program prepared the closed hearings of Joseph McCarthy for publication and provided historical information for senators, scholars, and the media. Being often interviewed by reporters, he began exploring the history of political journalism and previously published Press Gallery, Congress, and the Washington Correspondence, 1991, and Reporting from Washington, the History of the Washington Press Corps, published in 2005, and of course, as you've just heard, uh, just uh, a few days ago, the columnist leaks lies and libel in Drew Pearson's Washington. It's a great pleasure to uh, welcome Donald to the um, uh, Washington History Seminar. You've been a regular at our in-person sessions, so it's just a great pleasure to have you here to talk about your book. The Zoom room is all yours. Thank you, Christian, I appreciate that. And I also appreciate the National History Center and the Woodrow Wilson Center giving me the opportunity to talk about Drew Pearson. Uh, I began studying his career at a time when public trust in journalism really has reached an all time low. There have been polls recently that showed that a majority of Americans actually believe that reporters are trying to mislead them by publishing things that they know are false or, or exaggerated. And of course, politicians are constantly making charges of fake news. So with that kind of a backdrop, and I thought an historical evaluation of a controversial muckraker uh, and a columnist like Drew Pearson would be appropriate. Uh, he started back in 1932 with his daily column and he continued it until his death in 1969. The Washington merry-go-round appeared every single day, uh, even holidays, uh, in over 600 newspapers uh, at its peak. And then also he had a weekly radio show and later a, a television show as well, in which he not only reported the news, but was famous for making predictions of things to come. Uh, Pearson was a self-professed keyhole pe peeper. He uh, dismissed much of the news coming out of Washington as so much propaganda, what really the government's version of what the truth was. And he was determined to find out what was going on behind closed doors. 
So he revealed classified information and he passed along rumors from sources high and low throughout the government. Uh, now that going against the official line meant that he had to really, uh, he, had to, he had to make sure that he could back up what he was saying because uh, he had to be able to prevent uh, himself, himself from being sued or being prosecuted by the government. His fellow journalists claimed that he knew more dirt about more people in Washington than even the FBI. And those who worked for him said that uh, later on, they compared his efforts to what Daniel Ellsberg did with the Pentagon Papers or what Edward Snowden did with WikiLeaks, except that he did it daily for decades. Now, Pearson was a liberal and he was a humanitarian. Uh, he supported the New Deal, he opposed fascism. He promoted military preparedness before the Second World War. Uh, during the Cold War, he sought to reduce East-West tensions. He opposed the Red Scare. He particularly stood up against Senator Joseph McCarthy. Uh, later in his career, he uh, endorsed the Great Society while harboring some serious doubts about the war in Vietnam. He, throughout his career, exposed corruption at state houses and the US Capitol, and he claimed credit uh, for uh, censuring some, uh, some legislators, having some expelled, having some convicted and even imprisoned, and a lot more of them defeated for re-election. In 1944, the reporters in the Washington Press Corps voted Drew Pearson, the Washington correspondent who exerted the greatest influence over the nation. And they gave him twice as many votes as they gave to Walter Lippmann. By contrast, they gave him only two votes for accuracy and reliability. Now, Pearson had uh, avid readers and powerful detractors. Herbert Hoover tried to get him fired. FDR called him a chronic liar. Harry Truman had the FBI investigate him. Dwight Eisenhower ostensibly ignored him and sent out his press secretary to trash him. John Kennedy lamented that all of the powers of the presidency gave him no control over what the columnist wrote about him. LBJ tried to co-opt him and Richard Nixon put him at the top of his enemies list. And just to show the international side of all of this, Winston Churchill declared Drew Pearson to be the most colossal liar in the United States. Pearson was also sued 120 times for libel, more than any other journalist, and he won all but one of those cases. Now, my research uh, aimed to, to figure out what was behind a lot of those accusations of lies and libel. Uh, and the passage of a half a century since his death has opened a lot of government records, as well as his own massive collection of papers, uh, diaries, and oral histories. And they answer some significant questions about uh, who leaked to him, how accurate, accurate was the information that they provided and he collected, and how reliable was his journalism. So one measure of reliability is in those libel suits. Uh, uh, he was uh, uh, started uh, back in 1934 with his first libel suit, which was filed by General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, MacArthur objected to a Washington Mary Grand column that said that MacArthur had used his father-in-law's influence, his wealthy father-in-law's influence, to get uh, to win promotion to major general over a number of more senior officers. Now, Pearson was pretty sure that the story was correct because he'd gotten it from Douglas MacArthur's ex-wife but she would not testify in court as to what she had said at the dining table. And so there was a real worry that not only was uh, MacArthur going to sue Pearson for over a million dollars, but that he was gonna sue many of the newspapers that had carried the story as well. Uh, and eventually General MacArthur chose to withdraw the, the suit when uh, Drew Pearson managed to uncover some love letters that the general had written to uh, one of his mistresses whom he had abandoned. In most cases, however, uh, Pearson won his, his uh, lawsuits by proving that the stories that he wrote had, act, had been true. Uh, out of those 120 cases, the only one he lost, uh, he would have appealed except that his lawyers suggested that it would be a lot cheaper to settle. There was no national libel law at the time. You had to go by the state libel laws. And that meant for, if you were being sued in multiple states where, with multiple newspapers, you had to hire lawyers in each one of those states uh, you had to give depositions in each one of those states. You had to be aware of what the differences in the law were in, in all of those states. It was a very expensive proposition for him. Until 1964, when the Supreme Court finally ruled in the famous case of New York Times 
versus Sullivan that a public official has to prove malicious intent in order to win a libel case. And that's really shifted the burden uh, of a, uh, to the accusers rather than the accused in this case. The, uh, uh, the Sullivan case actually cited some of Drew Pearson's cases in its notes. And had that doctrine been rendered earlier, life would have been a lot easier for him and certainly a lot cheaper for him in the long run. But it also kept him uh, on his toes. He had to be able to prove the accuracy of those stories when, uh, when it came to a lawsuit. Another way of measuring his, uh, loss, his accuracy is in the government records that have opened since then. Uh, Pearson started out as a diplomatic correspondent and his earliest uh, attacks really were against the State Department. He uh, brought out information that he got from low level clerks and the highest level uh, officials, including one of his best friends who was Under Secretary of State, uh, Sumner Wells. Uh, Cordell well, uh, Hull, who was the, uh, the Secretary of State at the time, once began a meeting by saying, are we talking for this room or for Pearson? Uh, so much leaked out into the column. Another regular uh, uh, source for uh, Drew Pearson at the State Department was Alger Hiss, who was then the director of the State Department's Office of Special Political Affairs. Indeed, when uh, Hiss's colleagues worried about him leaking, it wasn't to the Soviets, but it was to Drew Pearson. Uh, and in fact, quite a bit of information did come from Hiss's office at that point. I've been able to verify a lot of this because the State Department now publishes its uh, foreign relations series, Fruis, uh, online as well as in paper. And during the pandemic, that came in very handy. Similarly, uh, the Winston Churchill archives are online and they provided some information as to why uh, Pearson so managed to annoy the British prime minister. Uh, he, he managed to print, uh, it wasn't that, that he was printing things that were tr untrue, he was printing verbatim uh, information from Winston Churchill's secret telegrams. Now in London, that would have gotten him prosecuted under the Official Secrets Act. But in Washington, the First Amendment protected him, much to Churchill's dismay. And in fact, uh, he was receiving information from American diplomats and American military officers who were offended by some of Churchill's really harsh stance towards uh, India and Greece and other uh, areas uh, of the world at that stage. In one instance, I was able to track down a leak of a Churchill telegram from a low-level official in the State Department uh, to someone at the, in the Indian High Commission in Washington who gave it to one of Pearson's legmen. That's what the legmen were reporters that Pearson hired to roam the corridors of the government to pick up information. In another instance, I found out that Winston Churchill was actually responsible for one of the leaks. And that was because he dictated a telegram so late in the evening that his secretary was so exhausted that he forgot to type guard at the top of the memo. He typed top secret, but not guard. And guard was the signal not to show this to the Americans. Uh, and so of course, as soon as it got to an American diplomat, it wound up in the Washington merry-go-round. Another terrific source for me was the FBI. Uh, they've released so far a thousand pages of information on Drew Pearson, I'm pretty sure they have a lot more. Uh, they, uh, uh, it shows the arc of his relationship with J. Edgar Hoover, who uh, he started out in the 1930s promoting as a super G-man. Uh, and in fact, we then got uh, the FBI to verify some of the information in his columns to read through things and to, to help him on some of the stories as long as the FBI was getting a good press. It got to the point where uh, Hoover was actually alerting uh, Pearson whenever the government wanted the FBI to tap his telephone. Uh, at one point uh, during the Truman administration, Hoover said to Pearson, you know how Harry is. Uh, and it is, in other words, this order came from the very top down. Pearson at that point said he had so many listeners on his telephone calls that he could have sold commercials. Now, uh, the FBI was monitoring his columns and his broadcasts. And they took his accusation seriously so that when he accused a member of Congress of taking kickbacks from his staff salaries, uh, the FBI would then investigate. And in many cases, uh, led to the prosecution of the members, including the chairman of the House Un-American Activities Committee, J. Parnell Thomas, uh, who uh, was convicted for of taking kickbacks and wound up in the same penitentiary with many of the Hollywood 10 that he had sent to prison for uh, contempt of Congress. 
Eventually, uh, Drew Pearson and, and J. Edgar Hoover fell out during the uh, McCarthy era, during the Red Scare. Uh, Pearson had became a persistent critic of Senator McCarthy. Uh, and McCarthy became so infuriated over the columns that he once beat up the columnist in Washington's Swank Sulgrave Club. It was at midnight, they were in the men's cloakroom. Uh, Pearson reached into his pocket to get some change to tip the attendant. Uh, uh, McCarthy pinned his arms, kicked him in the groin and slapped him in the face. Who should appear and step in between them but the new Senator-elect from California, Richard Nixon, uh, who broke up the fight and Pearson immediately left. And, uh, for years, uh, Nixon told the story and said, do you think it, it did me any good with Pearson? Never. Uh, but uh, this was an indication of uh, the, the severity of the relationship. And a couple of days later, uh, McCarthy then stood up in the Senate chamber and accused of uh, Pearson of being a communist puppet and uh, basically told people to boycott the sponsors of Pearson's radio show. And indeed the sponsor collapsed and, and pulled out the contract and Pearson lost half of his income as a result of the boycott that McCarthy launched against him. But eventually it was the Washington merry go -round that revealed the fact that one of McCarthy's young aides, G. David Shine had dodged the draft and persuaded the army to reclassify him and draft him as a private. And then the column revealed that another aide, Roy Cohen, was blackmailing essentially the army for, uh, to get uh, uh, basically favors for David, David Shine. So uh, uh, this led to the Army McCarthy hearings and this led to eventually to McCarthy's censure. So this was a, a considerable battle that went on uh, between uh, McCarthy and, uh, and, uh, and Drew Pearson. And as a result of that, uh, J. Edgar Hoover, who had sided with McCarthy and sided with the Red Scare, fell out completely with, uh, with Pearson. I could tell because of all the really nasty comments that uh, Hoover began writing in the margins of the memos that dealt with, uh, uh, the, with uh, the column and with the columnist at that time. However, despite the fact that their relationship really deteriorated, the FBI still found it useful from time to time to leak information uh, to the uh, uh, Washington Mary Ground when it was in their interest. I've also gotten a lot of information from presidential libraries, uh, uh, basically as to what was the truth behind the accusations that Pearson was making and that presidents were claiming were lies. I'll give you one example, uh, which was in 1956 when Eisenhower was running for re-election. The Washington Mary Grant said that as he left a meeting in Minneapolis, Eisenhower collapsed, uh, told his staff that he had to get out of there, that they, the, his limousine left the, the motorcade, they rushed him to the, uh, to the plane, flew him to the next location, and he and sequestered him in a hotel for 24 hours in which he wouldn't see anyone except for his doctor and his family. Now, uh, Jim Haggerty, who was Eisenhower's uh, press secretary, branded this as a complete fabrication, showed pictures of the motorcade that showed that the car had never, the president's car had never left the motorcade and said that Eisenhower worked through the next day and there was absolutely no truth to the story. And even uh, Pearson's own staff began to call it the boo-boo. But and now Eisenhower's library has his doctor's notes, which said that in fact, uh, Eisenhower uh, was suffering from exhaustion, high blood pressure. His doctor said, uh, called the president emotionally upset because of the exhaustion of the last three days and the prospect of the requirements to come. And he was indeed sequestered for, for a day uh, without uh, uh, doing any work. Uh, and uh, the column got some things wrong, but got the gist of the story correct. And in fact, a president's health is a newsworthy item that should be reported and not suppressed. So yes, uh, Drew Pearson made his share of mistakes. Mostly they came because of haste or misunderstanding. I never found a single instance where he deliberately lied about something uh, to, make it, to try to make a point. And in many cases, he retracted things that he got wrong uh, and uh, uh, faced up to some of the, uh, those issues. Was he the most colossal liar in the United States? Um, you know, I think he was more correct than he was incorrect. I think uh, his, his accusers were often lying to protect themselves. Uh, those who peddled stories to him sometimes, of course, had ulterior motives, but he did his best to verify their accusations. And most of all, he relied on his sense of smell. He said, if something smells wrong, I go to work. 
So like all media legends, after Pearson died and after he dropped from the, pure, the public's mind, he began to fade over time. In fact, today, if you Google Drew Pearson, you'll learn a lot more about football than you'll about journalism because there was a wide receiver for the Dallas Cowboys named Drew Pearson. And that Drew Pearson was actually named for his parents' favorite columnist. Uh, but uh, Drew, Drew Pearson's legacy really continues more in the investigative reporters who sprang up after his death during the Watergate period, who are still trying to uncover what, um, what basically the government doesn't want us to know, what politicians are trying to, uh, uh, to keep uh, back from in their stories. Uh, he was never, he was, as a columnist, he was never satisfied with just commenting on events that other people reported. He wanted to break news and he wanted to publish stories that others either didn't know or were too hesitant and didn't have the nerve uh, to report. So the question then is, is Drew Pearson still relevant? And I believe so. Uh, we want journalists to uncover what's really going on, not what politicians want us to believe. And he spent his career showing us how to do that. And Pearson also believed that journalists had a responsibility to make society better, at least by pointing out what was wrong with it. And he certainly did that. Let me close by uh, giving a, a, a suggestion to uh, all of you listening who are historians of the 20th century. Uh, every single column that Drew Pearson wrote between 1932 and 1969 is online at the American University's Digital Archives. It was a terrific gift for me in doing my research, but it is absolutely filled with quotable information, uh, interesting takes on what was happening, and sort of a real-time event following of the events of, of American history. So for those, uh, those of us who rely on journalists to do that first rough draft of history, this is a gift. Uh, and I, I highly recommend it. I think you'll find that it makes for a fascinating research. And I thank you again for this invitation to speak about the book today. Great, thank you so much, Don. Um, great presentation. I look forward to the discussion. We'll proceed now in alphabetical order. That means uh, David uh, Greenberg is up next. Uh, David is professor of history and of journalism and media studies at uh, Rutgers University. He's currently writing a biography of Congressman John Lewis, the civil rights leader for Simon & Schuster. He is the author of, uh, or editor of several books on American history and politics, including Nixon's Shadow, The History of an Image, published in 2003, Republic of Spin, An Inside History of the American Presidency, 2016, Calvin Coolidge, 2006, and Alan Brinkley, A Life in History, published in 2019. Formerly acting editor of the New Republic and columnist for Slate, he now writes for Politico, among many other scholarly and popular uh, publications. He holds a PhD in history from Columbia University and a BA from Yale and lives with his family in Manhattan. He's also an alumnus of the Wilson Center. I think he wrote The Republic of Spin at the center, so I'm delighted to Welcome you back, at least virtually, digitally, to uh, the Wilson Center. Uh, Zoom room is all yours, David. Thank you, Chris. And I would say I wrote some of the book at the Wilson Center. Um, if you had given me, you know, an eight-year fellowship, I could have done the whole thing. But uh, such is the nature of historical writing. Um, but it's always nice to be back at a Wilson Center event, whether uh, live or virtually. And it's especially nice to have a chance to comment on Don Ritchie's wonderful book. I've uh, admired Don Ritchie's work uh, and relied on it um, for, for years. Uh, he is known as the historian of the Senate, but of course is also one of the premier historians of American journalism. And for, for me, it's that mixture of the political knowledge and sensibility with the uh, interest uh, and recognition of the importance of journalism to American politics, especially in the 20th century that it makes his work so uh, rich and kind of point in so many different uh, directions that are kind of intellectually uh, fruitful for us. Um, there's a lot I could say in, in praise of this book. I kind of want to just maybe frame my remarks around uh, 
really three three different points here. Um, the first is to kind of to begin where, where Don did about the notion of Drew Pearson as a keyhole keeper. Um, to the extent that he's remembered today, which you know, as Don says is not well remembered enough, uh, it is as someone who trafficked a lot in scandal. And there is, or can be a certain disreputable quality to uh, that line of journalism, that track within journalism. Uh, I think Don, there is a soft, not at all heavy handed effort a little bit to maybe rehabilitate uh, Pearson or at least to direct us to the value of his work alongside the scandal mongering and gossip mongering and things he got wrong or where he was a little fast and loose, uh, which is certainly part of his uh, reputation and legacy as well. I remember reading somewhere, I was trying to remember who coined this, referring, I think, initially to the 1920s, but one could see a whole age of journalism from the 20s through the 50s or 60s as uh, the age of two Walters, looking at Walter Lippmann and Walter Winchell. And you, you could kind of swap in Drew Pearson for the Winchell slot. Um, both columnists, uh, one, Walter Lippmann trafficked in the high-minded, the elevated uh, matters of statecraft and diplomacy and, and policy, uh, while Walter Winchell and, and Drew Pearson sort of, you know, were much, um, were just as at home, if not more so, uh, looking at shady business dealings, uh, transactions, um, sometimes sex scandals, although as Don points, Pearson also pulled back a lot of the time from reporting on some of that stuff. Um, but there was a kind of comfort with um, scandal that I think was of a piece. I mean, you know, we, we many of us tend to uh, instinctively side with the, the Lippmann view of journalism, the Lippmann approach to journalism. Uh, and yet there's a value, even a kind of democratic quality uh, to the Winchell or Pearson approach. I think um, uh, Winchell once said, uh, define democracy as a system where anybody can kick anybody else's ass. It was sort of the idea there's a kind of rough and raw quality to democracy and having a press that even if sometimes it goes a little low, even if sometimes it doesn't quite uphold the same um, ethical standards, even if sometimes it loves to, you know, to wallow in the sensationalist, um, there's, a, there's a value in it for it's, it's kind of leveling quality, this reminder that none of these guys uh, none of these people in high office is really above us, that they all could be sort of laying low. And so I think it's useful to think about this book and Pearson's career sort of in that long history of a track, an approach to journalism that maybe gets less attention than the high-minded histories, you know, the Walter Lippmann biographies, the stories of what's going on at the New York Times or Washington Post. And there's a very elevated approach that there's another whole side of journalism which perhaps reaches more people that is equally uh, deserving of our attention as uh, scholars and, and readers. Um, a second uh, set of issues or questions uh, I, I had if, for, for Don sort of centers on the question of biography versus, oh, let's call it journalism history. Um, now, clearly, this book is, is both. It is a biography, but I'm struggling this with the same set of questions as I attempt to write a life of John Lewis, the congressman. Um, the question really is, how much does one sort of play Drew Pearson and sort of dig into the private life? How important is the private life? Um, you know, these are public figures. They're public work is how they were known and what defines them. Um, in Drew Pearson's case, it sounds from Don's book that he was quite the workaholic. So maybe there really isn't 
that much in, in the private life um, to report. Um, but I think Don clearly comes down on giving us the man through his reporting, um, through his work. And sometimes there's uh, windows into the private as when we learn about an affair with a former uh, secretary or assistant. Um, and I have to confess my, whether it's appetite for gossip or maybe a little more uh, nobly, a desire better to understand the man psychologically. Uh, you know, I wondered, for example, how did Louvi, his wife, react to the affair? They, you know, I wondered about that, but about his uh, children. I mean, there's there's some there's some uh, material on the relationship with his uh, children. There's some about his hobby of farming and the financial uh, uh, costs that that imposed. But in general, we don't see a lot of the private or even perhaps the psychological uh, Drew Pearson. And I imagine that was a choice dictated by, among other things, uh, sources and also perhaps an evaluation of where his importance lies. But I think as biographers, it's something that uh, we uh, struggle with and think about. You know, to, to what degree does the private life, the inner life, uh, shed light on the public life and how much it, when we're doing political history is it really the public product and the public relationships uh, that are uh, of, of the utmost importance. Um, then I guess the, the last thing I want to uh, sort of take up is the question of Pearson's uh, reputation and why he isn't better now. I'm of the generation who hears Drew Pearson, and at least until I became a historian, thought of the wide receiver. Uh, and then had to learn there was another Drew Pearson. And of course, now in my many years as a historian, I uh, know a lot about him and have seen his name in all kinds of stories. It's phenomenal research, by the way, in this book, and great to learn you know, things that maybe had been known, but one forgets, such as that it was Pearson who first had the David Shine uh, graft uh, avoidance story, that uh, many of these sort of uh, famous stories, scandals that did make big news at the time, uh, when we learn about them, we don't really learn the journalistic story about their revelation, about their disclosure. And it's, it's interesting to see just how many uh, of those stories Drew Pearson uh, was responsible for. Um, but I want to sort of uh, ask Don about why it is that despite having had a hand in many of these important stories, uh, Pearson hasn't come down to us as a more uh, well-remembered figure like say Walter Lippmann or even Joe Alsop or William F. Buckley, or maybe even as well known as Jack Anderson, who was his own, you know, leg man or assistant, and then you know took over the merry-go-round column. Um, it, 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 it's for someone who was uh, such a major figure, publishing every day in so many newspapers. Um, he, 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 he disappeared from public memory rather rapidly, and maybe that's just a function of journalism. Uh, that there is just an ephemeral nature to it. And the ones whose names and reputations survive are actually uh, you know, very few and uh, far between. Um, but I also wanna come back to, and here I may sound like I'm contradicting or questioning my earlier valuation of the keyhole, keyhole peeper, but it may be because so much of his energy was pushed, put into these, I keep using the word scandals, but um, you know, somewhat tawdry or petty uh, exposures. Uh, you know, at one point we learned that he spent, oh, I didn't write down the number, but you know, scores of columns in a row on um, you know, some irregularities involving Senator Thomas Dodd of Connecticut, which eventually led to Dodd's censure and 
not being reelected. Um, but ultimately, those stories, I mean, we want journalists to hold our politicians to account when there's corruption or when they cut corners. But a lot of that is stuff that thrills the media, gets a lot of attention inside Washington. But the public tends not to care that much about because what they care is, are the, is this politician doing a good job for me? And in our own era, when we see media frenzies about so many political scandals, sex scandals and, and sometimes financial scandals too, but the public often says to the reporters, and these days it's not even reporters, it's often pundits, television pundits and, and internet people, you know, thanks, but no thanks, we hear you. Thank you for reporting this. We're gonna reelect this person. We're gonna stand by this person, no matter what they did five years ago, seven years ago, even if there's some financial things that look a little dubious, even if there's some things in their personal life or aspects of their personality or how they treat their staff that we don't like. The public, I think, has always had a certain resistance. They like the stories, they like reading about it, but it doesn't really uh, constitute the stuff of um, uh, influential journalism. It's, it's, it's a lot of it's uh, noise and fun and, uh, 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 you know, has, has a kind of um, uh, appeal, but it's, it's only that. It, it, it's not of as much consequence as reporters sometimes take it to be. So I don't know, there may be other reasons that I'm not suggesting. I'd be curious to hear uh, Don's suggestion. But so if, what, what, why do we think that for a man who was such a major figure on the journalism scene, um, he hasn't left us with what we would call a, a legacy of the sort that uh, we you know, at least can name uh, a dozen other figures who, who are more uh, well known today. But anyway, with those as my uh, comments, I'll, I'll stop there and uh, uh, eager to hear uh, other thoughts. Thank you. Great. Thank you, David. Um, Don, would you like to respond to David's three points before we turn to Kathy? Yes, uh, just so quickly, uh, you know, uh, Pearson was uh, nominated for the Pulitzer Prize for that Thomas Dodd series. The reporters who were on the committee uh, unanimously voted to award Pearson the Pulitzer Prize but the Columbia University overseers thought that he was not the quality that they wanted to recognize and didn't give it to him. Uh, and, uh, and he missed out on a lot of those opportunities. Interestingly, his successor, Jack Anderson, who took over the column very shortly afterwards did win a Pulitzer Prize during the Nixon administration. And I think there are two things that helped to cloud over Pearson's reputation. One was Watergate, which completely changed the relationship of the press and the, and the politicians in Washington and changed the whole nature of investigative reporting, made heroes out of investigative reporters. Pearson had died just before that happened. He was the link between the old muckrakers and the Watergate era, but he was surpassed by, uh, by names that are much more familiar to us today in, uh, in the long run. The other is that just about that time of Watergate, a biography of um, Pearson appeared by Oliver Pilot who didn't like Pearson at all and is very critical. And it's the last book that's out there. And so whenever a scholar cites a book about Drew Pearson, it always tends to be pilot and it always tends to be sort of a negative account. Uh, one other uh, point on what David brought up is that uh, Pearson uh, certainly wrote a lot about political scandals. He didn't like to write about sex scandals. It might've had something to do with his private life. I'd suggest some things about that in the book to it why he would like to be, keep his own private life private. Uh, but he certainly didn't go into things that Walter Winchell would have published, except that if a really juicy story came along, Pearson would send it to Walter Winchell and Winchell would publish it in his column. Uh, but for the most part, you won't find that in, uh, in Pearson's columns. There are very few exceptions uh, over, over time. Uh, he is a little bit like Walter Winchell in that Winchell was writing about the private lives of the Broadway people and the Hollywood types and the the great the, the celebrities. Uh, you have in, in Pearson's column, he's writing about politicians, 
who are perhaps a little less colorful than the people that Winchell is writing. But Winchell was the single largest, uh, uh, most, most published uh, columnist in his day. Pearson was second, uh, but really writing about very different uh, subject matters. And uh, uh, there is a need, I think, you mentioned the word rehabilitation. And I think there is a certain degree of rehabilitation uh, that is uh, involved in the work that I've done. My book is not a biography per se. And I stepped away from that in part because I thought that what was really important about, uh, about Pearson was that column and how he addressed the nation on a daily basis. And that was really what I was trying to get at. Although uh, to tell the story, I had to tell it within a biographical framework, but there's a lot more to uh, Pearson's life. Uh, and perhaps someday someone will do a full soup to nuts biography. Thank you. It's now my great pleasure to bring into this conversation, uh, Kathy Kiley, who is the Lee Hill Chair in Free Press Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Her very distinguished career as a journalist spanned more than four decades, mostly in Washington, where she frequently, as she points out, used use the uh, Senate Historian's Office as an invaluable source. Kelly covered regional and national politics for a number of news outlets, including USA Today, the New York Daily News, Houston Post, the Arkansas Democrat Gazette, and the Pittsburgh Press. She served as, ed as an editor for WAMU, Bill Moyers, the Sunlight Foundation, Bloomberg Politics, and helped coordinate the national journal's campaign coverage with CBS News. She has also served on the Congressional Standing Committee of Correspondence and on the boards of the National Press Club Journalism Institute and the Daily Princetonian. She holds a master's degree from American University and a bachelor's degree from Princeton. It's wonderful to have you here with us, Kathy. Uh, Zoom room is yours. Well, thank you. And I'm really uh, honored to be asked to be in this conversation with the great Don Ritchie, who's uh, who was a source of mine for many years. And, um, and I think uh, this book is um, incredibly timely. Um, lies, leaks, and libel. Uh, we're talking about leaks right now. Uh, and we're talking about uh, journalists being accused of lies. And uh, the libel, I think, is a topic that's really important in this book. Uh, the point that Don made earlier about the important protection that was extended by um, Sullivan v. New York Times or New York Times v. Sullivan and uh, that protection which uh, some politicians would like to take away. So um, it's certainly an important topic and it's very timely. I think um, Pearson is very much um, a man of the day. Uh, he uh, was multimedia before there was multimedia um, as Don writes in his book. Uh, he recognized early that his audience was shifting to a different medium and he moved to that medium to meet the audience, which is something that we certainly teach today in journalism schools. Um, so he was a very prescient uh, journalist uh, and he was a very brave journalist. Um, and I would like to take off a little bit on uh, what David was saying, because I think he made a really excellent point. Uh, about the type of journalist Pearson was. And, um, and that is, he was not the type of journalist who was trying to get remembered by historians. Um, he was really working for his audience. And um, his audience were the people who were reading the newspapers. And as Don points out in his book, um, in some cases in Washington, DC, merry-go-round, well, first of all, let's just take the title merry-go-round. Um, he did have a sense of fun and he did have a sense of uh, the spectacle that politics really is. And I think, uh, I think you know, we talk a lot in journalism uh, about, and I think we're examining our consciences now because of the effect that some of this has had, but a lot of journalists tend to write about politics as if it were an athletic competition. And, uh, and that of course creates a sense of winners and losers and that can have an impact, I think has had an impact on our politics. But the reason for that is that journalists are trying to reach an audience that is not elite. 
Um, I don't want to write just for people who are like me. I want to write for everybody and to reach everybody. And so I think the one of the really essential qualities uh, of Pearson that, that comes out in this book, he was a blue collar reporter. Um, he worked blue collar hours, he worked every day. He was not, he, and what, one of the interesting things about him was that, uh, that really uh, comes through in this book is he lived in an elite world, um, but he never was captured by it. And, uh, and I think that's, uh, that is really an important uh, democratic function of journalism is, uh, and it really, he's a classic beat reporter. In Washington was his beat. He went in and there, he covered it every day. He, he and his leg men, and they were all men then, um, did, uh, did their beat reporting, did, you know, did the shoe leather reporting day in and day out. And, um, and then they made that information accessible to everybody. And the fact that merry-go-round uh, which you know obviously has an entertainment factor to the name was relegated to the comics page uh, in Washington. I think that was probably a good thing because you don't want. I mean, I don't think Pearson was ever aiming for an elite. Uh, there may have been times, and I think that also comes out in the book, uh, Don, when uh, you talk about him not getting invited to certain Georgetown parties and, uh, and having a, a reaction to that. And I think that's human, that's natural, but I think fundamentally his loyalty was to the story. And, you know, we say, uh, and uh, re reporters say, we're the only people who um, don't work for the people who pay us. Uh, the publisher may hand you the paycheck, but, um, it's the the audience, the listeners and the viewers and the readers who you're really working for. And, and I think um, boy, that really comes across uh, in this book with, with Pearson. And I think it's, um, uh, it, you know, it, it, I think the book really captures uh, something um, that certainly drew me to journalism. And it's something I hope will draw the students whom I now teach to journalism which is uh, that ability to be that, that bridge and, uh, and the willingness to, um, uh, to sometimes make powerful people angry with you. I mean, I think one of the things, uh, it, particularly now, as Dawn noted, uh, when journalists are under such attack, I mean, there's, and it's not just in this country, there's really a global war against free speech. Um, all over the world and, uh, and very similar tactics uh, being used by strong men all over the world. It's like there must be a dictator's handbook out there uh, that they're all studying from. But, uh, but this idea, which you see even in a, in a, a more stable time maybe, uh, or a time when journalists, journalism as a profession wasn't as under attack, but this idea that um, when confronted with uncomfortable facts, people uh, in powers immediate res immediately resort to calling somebody a liar. Um, and I think one of the great services, Don, you did in this book was to document how seldom that was actually true in the case of Drew Pearson. And that in fact, some of the very people who called him uh, a liar were feeding him information. Um, so I think one of the things you talked on about different ways in which you were trying to rehabilitate Pearson, um, and you talked about different, different measures of uh, his importance and his influence in Washington. One of the other measures I would offer is his longevity as a columnist and his ability to continue to break stories. That says that his sources still respected him. That says people were still willing to talk to him. People don't go back again and again to liars. And so I think, um, is somebody who writes every day going to get, don't going to make mistakes? Absolutely. Um, but there's a difference. And, and I think that's an important thing 
for us to talk about today, there's a difference between mistakes and falsehoods. There's a difference between um, an inaccuracy or moving too fast, which is almost an inevitable uh, quality of being a journalist and, um, and deliberate lying. And so I think uh, the, to the extent that people in power try to fuzz those two or conflate those two things, I think um, it's an effort to undercut journalism. Um, so uh, Pearson was clearly a very, he was a perfectly imperfect journalist, right? He was not, uh, this book also raises questions that we're talking about now with our students, which is, um, What's the difference between objectivity and neutrality uh, or neutrality and fairness? And I think Pearson's career uh, raises a lot of uh, questions about that. But one of the things that comes through, I think, um, is that he is, he was basically a do-gooder. Um, he wanted to be a player. Uh, he cared about the community he, he wrote about. Um, and he wouldn't have exposed so many scandals if he didn't care about the community he was writing about. It was all in an effort to make things better. Um, and I think sometimes people forget that uh, when uh, they see, you know, I, I think there's a case to be made that there's too much scandal mongering, but I think the function of battling corruption and the deterrent function that knowing there are people who are battling corruption has on our politics is a good thing. Um, and if we look at other countries where there isn't as much free speech, where our institutions, uh, the institutions aren't as robust and see how much corruption flourishes. I mean, I think, uh, you know, the vice president is down in Central America today. Uh, if you really wanna control the border, encourage journalists. And, and, and encourage freedom of speech and freedom of journalism in these countries where there's so much corruption and so much uh, criminality that uh, people are leaving. Um, one, of the, one of the things that makes a democratic society work is the journalism that exposes that kind of uh, wrongdoing. So I, I really am uh, grateful for this book. I'm gonna use it in my classes, um, but I have my question for Dawn is this. Uh, you have been this, worked in the Senate for all these years. You have met all these interesting politicians and you've done a lot of fantastic oral histories, but you've written so many books about journalism uh, and I use them all the time. Why journalists? What made you so interested in us. Thank you, Kathy, for these very thoughtful comments. Um, Don, a response? Oh, yes. Well, uh, thank you for that commentary. And uh, uh, there are a number of things, but, but one is the audience. I think you're absolutely correct about uh, Pearson cared about his audience. Uh, the, the column used to have a section called the mailbag, and he encouraged people to write in, and he would actually print parts of their letters in, in his column. And he responded to the letters that he got. So he was listening to what his readers had on their mind. And a lot of them, of course, objected to what he was writing about. So he would sometimes spar them as, as well. He was also very conscious of his editors. He had 600 different editors around the country. And many of them uh, were in fairly conservative newspapers that pretty well went against the grain of his column. Whenever he traveled around the country, he always made a point of stopping to visit the editors of local papers that carried the column. And he always called those editors boss. Uh, and sort of puffed them up a little bit in the process. Uh, but he was, he was conscious of that and it created some tension for the column, especially because he had so many Southern newspapers at a time when he was beginning to write about civil rights. And so that uh, he began losing a lot of the columns, uh, a lot of those papers as well. Uh, Kathy asked me why it is that I've written more about journalists than about the Senate. I suspect it was because I was interviewed so frequently as a, a, a Senate historian and for many years as the associate historian. In 2001, I, I started keeping a record of how many different journalists called me. And I, I, by the time we got to October of 2001, when my building was shut down because of an anthrax attack, I had logged in 331 different journalists, columnists, broadcasters, fact checkers, and others 
who had called with questions. And it just made me curious about how was it that uh, journalists went about their business and how accurate were the reports that they were making? Because as an historian, I was going back and reading those old newspapers and I'm having to have some confidence in what I was reading about. So it created this, uh, this fascination for me and it's uh, certainly carried out. And I have to say also as a public historian, I felt a little uncomfortable about writing about the people who were paying my salary. So it was a little easier to write about the people who were like me. They were outside the institution, but they were trying to understand how the institution worked. And it just created a fascination that's wound up producing several books. Thank you. Um, we're, as we prepare to uh, open this up, the conversation up to our audience, uh, let me remind everyone that uh, there are a couple of ways to participate. Uh, our preference is for you to intervene directly by using the raise hand function and we will call on you um, and you can pose your question or you can use the Q&A function up in the Zoom functionality and post your question and uh, we will uh, share it with uh, the panelists. Um, I think Eric, before we, uh, uh, we take audience questions, I think you have a question for Don. Thank you, Christian. Um, this is a very engaging book. Um, and I'd like you to talk a little bit more about the politics, Pearson's politics. Um, he's a liberal cold warrior. Um, and you have a chapter um, called Battling McCarthyism. And, you know, historians, you know, make it you know, clear these days that McCarthyism extended beyond McCarthy. Um, and Pearson takes down um, J. Parnell Thomas, but on corruption issues, mm -hmm. um, not on anti-communism or his browbeating of witnesses, you know, and the like. Uh, and so it strikes me that at least with regard to anti-communism, Pearson is pretty cozy with Hoover, um, who has a big hand in much of the anti-communist crusade of the 1940s and 1950s until Hoover gets mad at him. Um, but, but to what extent you know, is his battle against McCarthy the man? Um, and to what extent does he reflect upon the larger phenomenon uh, of the Red Scare uh, and of anti-communism? Um, and to what extent does he engage it with other institutions and other political actors? Well, the Red Scare was a difficult issue for, uh, for Pearson. And uh, he was uh, rather sympathetic to the Soviet Union during the war and very critical of British colonialism. Uh, and there, was a, there were various camps in the city. Uh, but after the war, he began to become suspicious of some of the, the uh, Soviet sympathizers who he had been tapping into, uh, that some of them were more than just sympathizers. Uh, He's the first journalist to report on the Canadian sca sca uh, spy scandal, Ivor Gosinski, and, and that uh, uh, brings him on his, his program uh, and uh, really helps to get the whole uh, Red Scare started in a lot of ways. But by 1950, uh, Pearson had felt that the FBI and the, the Justice Department had done a good job of rooting out anybody who was a, a suspicious character in the government, and he thought McCarthy was being irresponsible. Uh, and he, uh, uh, he really became very strong for civil liberties at that stage. Uh, so he, it, he actually believed that there was a, a communist issue. And in fact, of the matter is he did have one of his legmen turned out to be a member of the Communist Party. Uh, he had to fire him as a result of that. He tried to hang on to them, but in the Red Scare atmosphere, he couldn't do that. And another one of his key legmen was probably a fellow traveler who had incredible connections uh, to the far left but never actually, apparently never actually joined uh, the Communist Party. But that made Pearson vulnerable at a time when there were professional red hunters out there. He uh, had actually used Joe McCarthy as a source for years. McCarthy was always looking for good publicity. And in fact, when he finally broke with McCarthy after the Wheeling speech, uh, Jack Anderson said to him, but Jack, but you know, Drew, he's, he's our good source. And Pearson said, well, he may be a good source, but he's a bad man. And he really fought McCarthy on principle. Uh, the, the, the real Quaker uh, inside of uh, uh, Pearson came out when it came to dealing with McCarthy. And he saw what McCarthy was doing to the careers of, uh, of others. I think in many ways, Pearson was probably the most important journalist in taking on McCarthy, largely because he was so persistent in doing it. Uh, he was, it was a drumbeat in his columns. 
years ago when I was working on the 19th century, I read Lord Bryce's American Commonwealth. And he had a comment about the fact that a single story in a single newspaper rarely made much of a difference. That the, the stories really became important when the press really hammered home on repeating the story over and over until the public suddenly woke up and paid attention. And that was one of uh, Pearson's strengths is he had the right and the ability with his column to pursue a column pr uh, relentlessly. So there are at least 50 columns about uh, McCarthy, just on McCarthy and what's wrong with McCarthy. And eventually, of course, when the public gets to watch the Aaron McCarthy hearings, the McCarthy they see on television is the McCarthy that Pearson's been describing in his column for years. Don, you might um, mention, uh, that you might talk a little bit about um, Pearson's role in starting the State Department Correspondence yeah. Association and what uh, triggered that. Because I think um, that's an, that was an incredibly brave thing to do. Um, yeah. Why he did it was brave. It was in the 1920s. Uh, he was a diplomatic correspondent for the Baltimore Sun. The Secretary of State at the time said that he didn't want to have foreign correspondents at his press meetings because he saw foreign correspondents as essentially spies for their government. And he just arbitrarily banned them. And Pearson organized a standing or the diplomatic corps of correspondents that was very similar to the Standing Committee of Correspondents on Capitol Hill. As far as I know, we're the only government where the instead of the government giving out press passes and deciding who's a legitimate journalist, the government allows journalists to make that decision. They do it at the White House with the Correspondents Association, and Pearson brought it to the State Department as well. Stood up for the foreign correspondents and there. Foreign correspondents have a real hard job in Washington uh, because politicians often don't want to talk to, to journalists who their constituents are never going to read. Uh, and so uh, it, was a, it was part of his crusading spirit to, to take that fight up at the time. Great, thank you. Let's go to uh, our viewers um, or listeners. Um, the first one I'd like to call is Ives Kamshe. And if you could please introduce yourself to the panelists. Um, Please unmute yourself once. Call. Please unmute yourself. You should get a prompt and press yes, in which case uh, should be able to hear you. If not, I'm afraid we'll have to move on to, to Jim Banner. Jim Banner. Um, Don, um, I, I want to compliment you because this is one of the rare seminars in the series in which I found myself laughing and it's just as well <laughs> that, the, um, that my microphone was turned off. I mean, it's I, it, the, the, some of the stories are wonderful. And I also, before I ask my question, want to compliment um, David's smart question um, uh, about um, why these people such as, uh, such as Drew Pearson aren't remembered as well. It may be, um, David, that they don't write books the way Del David Halberstam did and Woodward and Bernstein did and so on, at least um, Drew Pearson didn't. My question, Don, for you is this. We've, we've gotten it. I want to ask you to enlarge the context um, of your discussion a little bit. We seem to have ventured a little bit into the post-Drew Pearson years. Could you say a little bit more about where the likes of Pearson and Walter Winchell came from? In other words, where did that kind of investigative, muckraking, gossip mongering, a uh, columnism um, come from? When did it originate and where did, where did these two pick up their manner of going after reportage, going at reportage? Okay, well, thank you for the question. And also thank you for telling me that you left uh, when I told a joke in there because you never know with a Zoom audience if uh, people are, are amused by your comments or not, and I appreciate that. Uh, Walter Winchell came out of vaudeville uh, and he was caught up with vaudeville gossip, backstage gossip, the nightclub gossip. And he started his column saying he was turning mud into gold. Uh, Drew Pearson came out of journalism. He was a, 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 a diplomatic correspondent, 
But in his youth, he had uh, worked for his father's, who his father organized Chautauqua tent uh, tra uh, events. And Pearson used to have to arrange uh, parades and uh, other things to get an audience to come in to buy tickets. And so there was a bit of a showman, even a bit of a huckster in Pearson that he used to sell his, his columns and also his radio programs. The fact that he did his predictions at the end of the radio programs and claimed that they were 82% accurate, that brought in an audience. It helped to get people curious about what it was that he was going to predict and see how, how, how accurate it was. Uh, but they definitely were interested in gossip. They, uh, both of them uh, tr traded in stories like that. And gossip actually, uh, even though it has a sort of a negative connotation to it, as uh, one of the other journalists I was looking at at the time said, you know, gossip introduces people. Uh, it gives you information about their character. And what you're trying to do is explain to an audience, who are these politicians? You know, who is this cabinet secretary? Who is this US Senator? What's, you know, are they, are they really as pompous as they look on the, in the newsreels or, you know, as they, they try to appear in public? What's the private side of it? So uh, Pearson would write about the high stakes winnings of a vice president, for instance. Uh, and he'd, he'd write about uh, uh, the hijinks that were sometimes going on in the process to give a little more personal side. Not always what the politicians wanted to, uh, to see in the newspaper, uh, but uh, because they were trying to create shape their own image in many ways, uh, but uh, it was humanizing in that sense. And so uh, Pearson and, and Winchell do have that, uh, that affinity. They, Pearson and Winchell were close friends. They both appeared on the, uh, that broadcast on the radio on the same channel on Sunday nights. They kept very much in contact with each other for years. They fell out over the Joe McCarthy issue. Uh, Pearson became an opponent of McCarthy. Winchell became an ally. It destroyed Winchell's career eventually to be associated with, uh, with Joe McCarthy. Uh, but uh, basically their friendship disappeared and they, they never were able to uh, resolve it. Thank you. We'll go next to Edward Merlis and Kathy and David, feel free to chime in at, at any point. Please introduce yourself to the panelists. First, you have to unmute yourself. Having a little trouble with the technology here today. Well, I'll, um, while you're waiting for the unmute, I'll just jump in to say, I think Don made a really important point there, which is, um, and, and it's, it, it, there, you see it several times in, in Pearson's career. Um, you know, as a keyhole peeper, he depended on access and, and that comes out in the book. You know, he worries about when there's a change of administration, will he still be able to get access to sources? But I think what's so striking about Pearson is uh, just as in that story that Don told about Jack Anderson saying, hey, he's a good source. Um, yeah, he may be a good source, but he's a bad person. I think that um, that religious side of Pearson really comes out that in the end, and this is a real dilemma for a lot of journalists, are you willing to trade the access um, and, to, and to burn a source um, if it's the right thing to do? And he did it. And I think that again is a very impressive, especially for a guy who was writing a column every day and really depended on access. Um, his willingness to do that, I think is a real mark of integrity. Thank you. The other thing I might add sort of to Jim Banner's questions about sort of the, the origins of where it came from. I mean, Don made reference to Winchell and Pearson's, uh, you know, personal backgrounds, but I think sort of intellectually and professionally, we might say there's a certain lineage to the muckraking. And of course, you know, we think of uh, the writers who Theodore Roosevelt labeled with that term. When I was writing Republic of Spin and went back and read a lot of their journalism, I was surprised to see how, even though we remember them as sort of these policy reformers, good government types, uh, who set themselves apart from the yellow press and the sensationalism of their day, they actually used that whole same set of journalistic tools of this kind of florid writing, hyperbole, appeals to the emotion in order to sort of 
grab readers by the lapel and sort of shake them a bit. And so, you know, this uh, eventual distinction that I talked about, like the two Walters, the high-minded Lippmann and the low-minded uh, Winchell, if you look at many of those muckrakers, it, it's kind of in there together. And, um, you know, I think that early period of sort of early 20th century, even late 19th century uh, journalism that's looking at scandal, looking at expose, um, you know, its own age of disclosure and revelation, you know, uh, this is the stuff that Louis Brandeis writes about in the right to privacy, that journalists are going too far. There's, there's that double-edged quality of kind of peering into stuff that should be private, but also bringing to light, um, you know, what should be brought to light for democracy's sake. And those two things going hand in hand. And I think it's fair to say that Pearson sort of comes out of that era. He's the, he's the next generation after that. Thank you. I'd like to call on John Martin next, since we couldn't make uh, uh, the technology work for Edward Merlis. John Martin, a veteran of the business. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I, I appreciate being getting a chance to answer, ask a question. I covered Washington for 18 years for ABC News, and I used to walk by Jack Anderson's house on 16th Street every day on my way to the office. And I can tell this is a fabulous book about Drew Pearson, but I'm, I'm wondering just how big a role did Jack Anderson play or how, whether his legacy is considerably different than Pearson. Well, that's a very good point. Uh, actually, uh, uh, Jack Anderson is a major player in the book. When uh, Pearson fired uh, Andrew Older, who was a communist uh, during the Red Scare, he had to hire somebody and he hired a young uh, a reporter who was at, at with the uh, Stars and Stripes is still in uniform, and that was Jack Anderson, still in his 20s, who came as a legman, a very underpaid legman for, uh, for Drew Pearson, and stayed with him for the rest of his career, and eventually inherited the, uh, the column. And much of the, from the, uh, midway in the book, when Anderson appears, much of the story is the linkage between Anderson, who was out to, he was a, a really aggressive reporter, is one of the uh, people on, on the Pearson staff said Jack Anderson would write a story about his own wife if he came across it, whereas Pearson's made a, main objection was to make the world better in the process. And so uh, Anderson actually drove the column in directions that uh, that Pearson might not have otherwise. And so, uh, uh, and he provided a terrific amount of, of material. But Drew Pearson was the anchor for Jack Anderson, and when. Uh, when Pearson died and Anderson took over the column, for a little while it just flourished and he won the Pulitzer Prize in 1971 and he was involved in, he wrote 400 columns about Watergate in 1973 and 74. I uh, was really swept up in all of that, but he began to make some big mistakes. And I think without the anchor of Drew Pearson, uh, Jack Anderson drifted and some of the really negative connotations of his later career um, to some degree came because he was no longer in partnership with Pearson, but to some degree it also uh, affected Pearson's reputation because as Anderson's reputation sank, uh, a lot of people compared him to Pearson. Uh, there was a sort of guilt by association uh, situation. Uh, and uh, Anderson's later career was, was uh, very uneven, unfortunately. A very good book by Mark Feldstein about uh, uh, poisoning the press deals with Anderson's relations with Richard Nixon. And there's a whole nother story that you can follow in here about the role of Richard Nixon in, in sort of corrupting the relations between politicians and the press at the time. Nixon and Pearson didn't get along from the day that Nixon was elected. Even though Nixon broke up that fight with Joe McCarthy, uh, it was not a, 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 a good relationship. And later when Watergate finally broke, uh, Anderson wrote a column saying, by gosh, uh, Drew Pearson was right about Nixon. Thank you. We have a question posted by Richard Willing. Um, can you describe the substance of the stories his leaked to Pearson? How many served intelligence or propaganda purposes? What did Pearson think of Chambers and the his revelations? Did he believe himself used? Uh, uh, his leaked to, um, to uh, Pearson's uh, legman, 
uh, David Carr and Andrew Older, both of whom had links to the Communist Party, actually. One was a, probably a fellow traveler, one was actually a party member. Uh, they found his always uh, cooperative in part because uh, Pearson and his legmen were in the group that were uh, sympathetic to the Soviet Union as an ally during the war and more critical of, of the British uh, col colonialists. Uh, they, and so uh, I'm not sure exactly the type of information they were able to get from, uh, from Hiss, although FBI agents knew that they were visiting Hiss on a regular basis. Uh, a lot of things passed through. The State Department was actually very loose with documents. Noel Field, who was a, actually a Soviet spy, said that it was an easy job for him because the documents were just spread around. So many copies were sent around from place to place. And so uh, Hiss's office could provide uh, all sorts of things. I, I don't think that they had a lot to do with um, espionage in any way. That I don't think there's anything that dealt with espionage. They were inside uh, politics about what was going on inside the State Department. In some cases, they were actually private citizens' letters that were being intercepted by the government during the war if they were being sent to foreign countries. And Pearson was able to get hold of those. And most likely, they never were able to track it down, but most likely it came through the State Department. It came through the State Department. It very likely came through Hiss's office. Uh, now, when, when Hiss was accused by Chambers, uh, Pearson actually believed Chambers. And he became very suspicious of Hiss afterwards. He became very suspicious of a number of his sources during the war years, Harry Dexter White and others uh, that, um, uh, and his column began to shift and he, he did not uh, blame the Cold War on the United States the way a lot of revisionist historians have. He wrote a column early on by saying, to, uh, so an open letter to Joseph Stalin saying, you know, uh, I understand what you're doing to try to consolidate your power in Eastern Europe, but you're, do you realize you're breaking the faith of all these people who were your allies during the war uh, and, and all the goodwill that built up in the in the United States. And Pearson noted that when he criticized uh, Russia, when he criticized uh, the, you know, the Hiss, and when he criticized others in the early years of the, of, the, of the Red Scare, the letters that he got from people saying, what are you doing? You know, you, uh, Soviet Union is our ally. We should be supporting them. Uh, within five years, when he raised any questions about Joe McCarthy, people were writing him letters saying, what are you doing? The Soviet Union is our enemy. He said, the pendulum had swung very broadly between 1945 and 1950. And he could tell that by the tenure of the, the mail that he was getting from his readers. Thank you. We'll go next to Dan Teodoro, who's been patiently waiting, and then to Gordon McKinney. Dan Teodoro, if you could please unmute yourself. Hey, folks. Really seems to be a bug in the technology here today. Uh -uh. Okay, then we uh, can we go to um, Gordon McKinney. Maybe some folks could put their okay. questions in. Yeah. Yeah, Gordon, if if you could please unmute yourself. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, Don, uh, as a historian of the 19th century, the most striking thing about uh, columnists and newspapers was their commitment to partisan organizations and their willingness, in a sense, to be spokespersons for either candidates or parties. Uh, did Pearson face any problems with this type of thinking in his own work? Well, uh, thank you, Gordon. The good question. He was certainly a partisan in a lot of ways, but he tried not to make his column a partisan column uh, for a variety of reasons. Uh, he, he was essentially a liberal, uh, and the, both political parties were divided between liberal and conservative wings. So Pearson liked Democratic liberals, and he liked Republican liberals, and he didn't want to make it a, a Democratic uh, column. There were certainly a lot of Democrats that he very much disagreed with, uh, and, uh, and so he wouldn't support them. He, uh, he did, however, really promote, and he had very good sources inside the Republican Party because they were liberal Republican senators who were telling him what 
Robert Taft was, was saying in the Republican conferences uh, because of the divisions that existed in the parties today. Today, of course, those don't exist at all. I mean, the, the conservative Democrats have disappeared, the liberal Republicans have disappeared, and the parties have gotten so polarized. The other thing that kept Pearson from being uh, overtly partisan was that the majority of the editors who published his column were Republicans and conservatives. And so he didn't want to write a column that would offend them and that they wouldn't, they wouldn't publish. And so they were happy whenever he attacked the New Deal, for instance. And they accepted the fact that other places he supported the New Deal. Uh, when Eisenhower becomes president, he doesn't want to automatically say, well, I'm a Democrat and I, I can't support his administration. He looks for things that he thinks that Eisenhower will be good at. He thinks Eisenhower will be a man of peace. And he thinks that Eisenhower will bring a McCarthy down. And so uh, he promotes Eisenhower up to a point. He gets tired of him. In fact, the chapter on Eisenhower is called Disliking Ike. And they really fall out uh, in that administration. But he did not wear his partisanship on his sleeve. Maybe part of that is the fact that he lived in the District of Columbia, which didn't vote for anybody uh, for years until 1961. Uh, Pearson had registered as a Republican as a young man in Pennsylvania. And it wasn't until uh, 1961 that he registered as a Democrat because he now could vote in the District of Columbia for in the presidential elections. But uh, he's not as overtly partisan as the 19th century ones. It's quite clear with the 19th century, when you start reading the newspaper, the first column is that the Democrats have perpetrated another uh, horror upon the nation. You know where this, where this reporter stands, you know where this newspaper stands, and everybody expected that. Uh, but that's, uh, that disappears in newspapers in the late 19th century when, when they'd start depending on, on commercial advertisements rather than political advertisements. And, and the big department stores don't want to only sell to Democrats or only to Republicans. They want to sell to everybody. And so that helps to promote objectivity in the news. But people like Pearson as a columnist had a pass. They didn't have to be objective. They could be advocates. They could take sides. And many of Pearson's contemporaries were overtly Republican or overtly Democratic or overtly liberal or overtly conservative. Pearson's interesting because he tries to balance it, and his column is a mix. And as I point out in the book, he irritated Franklin Roosevelt enormously. He frustrated Harry Truman to a great degree. To, so Truman sent the FBI to investigate him. He frustrated John F. Kennedy. The only president he was close to was Lyndon Johnson, and that was because Lyndon Johnson worked very hard to make sure that Drew Pearson would be in, in his camp throughout his presidency. I, you know, I think that's a, a really good point you made, Don. And I think the other um, the other thing that uh, would have kept him more uh, or less partisan, I think, would be his desire to break stories. Mm -hmm. And if you want to break stories, the, the other thing that you point out in your book is that he was about reporting, and um, and and so that even when the editors got mad at him uh, because they thought he was too liberal they would keep running his column because he just broke too many good stories. And, uh, and so I think in order to keep those kind of sources though, if you're too far to one side or the other, you're going to alienate uh, people. And so it's important, I think, for a journalist to, um, even if you are a columnist, you don't wanna be so to the one side or the other that, uh, that both sides aren't gonna talk to you. And I think that's, uh, that was another factor in, uh, in helping him to be less partisan. Thank you. Uh, Dan Teodoro posted his question, so let me read it to you, Don. I knew PNA in the 60s. He once said to me, I don't dig into history, I slice through it. And that seems to be the point. He never lied, but he was rather superficial, hence no lasting depth. Don't you think that this is the problem with the news media to this day, as people can now expose their their views on Facebook, just as a journalist and the public discourse is as superficial as that of the media. So neither is deemed any longer worth attention because both tend to be poorly predictive mm. and of little lasting value. Um, so people no longer care for journalists, but prefer banging away at each other's opinion. We have a couple more questions. So if you can keep it short, we can get a few more in. So I'll just say that if uh, Drew Pearson had been able to use social media, he would have, he would have figured out how to maximize uh, its, uh, its abilities. Uh, th that was the one thing he was afraid actually that newspapers were shrinking and that 
that, that his type of criticism wouldn't find an outlet anymore. I think he'd be happy that there was social media. He wouldn't be happy with a lot that's on the social media, but he'd be happy that there were that many more avenues to promote the news. At Washington merry-go-round would be a great Twitter handle. I'm sure he would. <laughs> <laughs> um, great, thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, what was the one case that he lost? You mentioned that he uh, won most of his case, but one he lost, which one was that? Uh, it was a fellow named Norman Liddell, who was actually one of his friends for a while, but they fell out uh, and he accused him of lobbying for the Dutch government for uh, against uh, Indonesian independence. And uh, uh, Littell sued him and won a, a $50,000 account uh, libel suit. Uh, they eventually settled it for 40,000. He really wanted to appeal, but uh, the, the lawyers basically said, it's gonna cost you more to appeal this than it would cost you to settle this case at the time. Interestingly, Littell's uh, lawyer was Edward Bennett Williams. And afterwards, uh, Williams went to see Lou V. Pearson and said, by the end of that trial, I'd grown to hate my client and really love Drew Pearson. Pearson was right, he should never have lost that case. And, uh, they and Edward Bill Williams became a big source for uh, Pearson for years. Uh, it was very close to the family. And when Pearson died, uh, Williams uh, volunteered to help his widow settle the estate. Uh, so it's interesting that one case that he lost, uh, he at least won the alliance of the of the opposing lawyer and developed a very good source as a result. Thank you. There's a question from Gerald Fetner. Pearson grew up in the first um, two dec days, first decades of the 20th century. I wonder who might have been some of his mentors, idols. For example, he is a contemporary of David Lawrence, who was one of the first journalists to establish a nationwide syndicate. David Lawrence is the first one to hire Drew Pearson for a significant job. He hired him to, uh, he's just started the United States Daily uh, in the late 1920s and Pearson became a diplomatic correspondent for them. He'd been trying to break into the business. He was uh, a freelance journalist before that. And uh, uh, he uh, came down to Washington to meet with William Hard, who was also a very prominent journalist, had been a muckraker. Uh, and he was trying to get advice on how to break into the business. And on that trip, uh, William Hard was ill and so Hard's widow, uh, his, his wife, took Pearson to a dinner they were supposed to go to at the home of Sissy Patterson. Uh, and that's where he met and uh, the woman that he eventually married, which is Sissy Patterson's daughter. Sissy Patterson happened to own one of the major newspapers in Washington, the Washington Times Herald, became a very support, strong supporter of Pearson's for many years, eventually became a terrible enemy of his uh, in later years. But uh, uh, he, that brought him into Washington politics in a lot of ways. Lawrence was a, was a key person in, in uh, bringing him in. Uh, it probably Sissy Patterson persuaded uh, Lawrence to hire him. And then uh, Pearson went to work for the Baltimore Sun uh, and uh, was a diplomatic correspondent for the Sun. When his first book was published called Washington Mary Graham, it was very critical of the Hoover administration. Hoover had the Bureau of Invest Investigation find out who the anonymous authors were to try to get them fired. And uh, his partner, Robert Allen, was fired by the Christian Science Monitor for writing this anonymous attack on the Hoover administration. People in Baltimore didn't think that uh, a book that criticized Washington was worthwhile firing anybody for. So they thought it was something of a laugh that, uh, that Pearson was in there. But they eventually did fire him for other reasons, but, uh, uh, but he stayed on at, the, at that particular time. So yes, he did have, have uh, supporters and, and people he modeled himself after. Uh, another person that he always cited as a model was Paul Anderson. Paul Y. Anderson won a Pulitzer Prize for covering the Teapot Dome scandal during the 1920s. And Anderson is really a link between the old muckrakers and when Pearson comes along. And I think that uh, that was, they were contemporaries and he, he admired his uh, crusading spirit. Thank you. I'm afraid we have reached the point at which uh, we will have to bring this to an end. Um, let me, um, with thanks to Don and Kathy and David, turn this over to Eric for some concluding remarks. Don, there are lots of uh, nice notes in the Q&A post. We'll try to save those for you as well as a few questions we couldn't get to, so sorry about that. Eric, final words. All right. 
Let me add my thanks uh, to our panelists today, Don, Kathy, David, and of course, Christian, as well as those of you in the audience, our apologies to those whose questions we could not uh, get to. We invite you to join us next week, Monday, June 14th at 4 p.m., when we reconvene to discuss Dorothy Sue Cobble's new book, uh, For the Many, American Feminism and the Global Fight for Democratic Equality. Please join us for that session. And thank you for joining us today. Good night, everyone, and take care.